we move along with time in our work and in our play just a fleeting moment and it dawns another day days turn into seasons summer heat and winter cold but god keeps another time so i am told can you see the clock from where you stand can you tell the hour by the pointing of the hand night is fast approaching there are shadows in the land can you see the clock from where you stand i seem to know the season for the planting and the plow but there's a greater harvest that's going on right now gathering wheat into the barn until the trumpet blows reaping will come to a close can you see the clock from where you stand can you tell the hour by the pointing of the hand night is fast approaching there are shadows in the land can you see the clock from where fast approaching there are shadows in the land can you see the clock from where you stand can you see the clock from where you stand anyway before we Get into, the next, get into my message. Let's rise and ask for the Lord's blessing because we need his blessings. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for your grace. We come before your throne of grace, O oh God. We know, O oh God, that we are always subject to you. We know that we have to plug into you to get fruits, to get results of what you want to achieve in us, but you have to use us to achieve what you want. So it goes hand in hand, and we ask that you will use us in, the manner, in a manner that will bring make a difference and bring a difference in people's lives you will allow your holy spirit to work through us to make to clarify things to bring uh closure to things or even uh, uh, understanding of things in jesus mighty name i pray this thank you father you may be seated when i was uh, the first, when i first got saved there was a scripture that was used regularly against against me and the reason it was used against me is the people that were using the scripture obviously did not understand the scripture. And it, it shut me down to a certain extent because I was ignorant of what the scripture meant. And I'll first uh, mention it in German before I put it up in English. It's, uh, this is what, for those who understand German, it was, Wer sich lässt denken, er stehet, mag wohl zusehen, dass er nicht falle. Put it up in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Very interesting scripture. And the meaning is very, very easy to understand once you understand uh, the faith journey. Wherefore, let him that thinketh thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. This is a mind game. This is a, 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 you're thinking on your own thoughts, you're standing. So we do not stand on our thinking. This is what we stand on, Romans 11. Verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. 
You stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. That explains that scripture, the previous one. We do not stand by wer sich lässt denken, er stehe, der mag wohl zusehen, dass er nicht fall. That's, that's the other, that's a person living a, a pious, self-righteous life who thinks he is perfect in his own flesh and he cannot fall. That is not the case. I, th I stand and I will never fall because I stand on a foundation which is Jesus Christ. My rock, that rock cannot be moved. It cannot be shaken. We have built, I have built upon the solid rock and when the foundation even is blown or, or the, the winds come and, the, and it, it hits the building, the foundation will be sure, I might be shaken, but my foundation is Jesus Christ. He will stand through hell, high water, whatever is to come. Jesus Christ will be that foundation, and that's who I trust in. In uh, Romans 12, in verse 2, uh, my message is, is partly is, uh, is our minds. Our minds are our, your everyday life, your thought life is your biggest enemy or your biggest friend, depending on how you approach your mind. You have heard the saying, you cannot stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop it from building a nest. The meaning to this is, your thought life, you have thoughts, Satan or the Holy Spirit can plant thoughts in your life. The Holy Spirit usually works together with the Word of God and through your heart, confirming it through the Holy Spirit. But Satan can do the same thing. He can plant thoughts in your life, but usually they are, will not line up with the Word of God and you have to discern them, and then you're the one that will allow them to have, to bear fruit, to become fruitious, to become something that uh, the fruit of it will not be good. So what you want to do is avoid those thoughts of negativity, especially of, of, of uh, lust, of whatever your thought life is. Do not allow Satan to... Uh, bear fruit, uh, let that, that thought life become part of your life. You need to put a stop. You are in control, control of your thought life. Nobody else is. So you have, there's an outcome to every thought that you bring into, to your, into, your life, into your mind. And you need to make sure that that thought, if it's from the Satan, you tell him where to go with it. You will never stop it from coming. That is not in your control, but you can stop it from bearing fruit. You tell Satan, get behind me, just like old Rachel Basel what used to say from Montana, get behind me, Satan. Those are your thoughts, not my thoughts. So get away from me, Satan. In Romans, in, uh, uh, Romans 12, verse 2, out of the King James Version, it says, and be not conformed to this word, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is an ongoing process after you've become born again because your, your mind did not become born again. Let me repeat that. Your mind did not become born again. You have to transform your mind, your thought. You have to transform it to, to different thinking. Renew it by the, by the word. Uh, but you... Put, but you... Uh, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is... Uh, that good and acceptable and perfect. What is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God? So that is your choice. The Holy Spirit did His work. He is there. He made you born again. Now the journey begins for you to live a victorious life. In the Second Corinthians, verse ten, or chapter, uh, in Second Corinthians ten, verse three and six to six, it says, "For though we walk in the flesh." And while we're in this body, we will walk in the flesh. We do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, not some, every thought to the obedience of Christ, and then the victory comes, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. That simply means once you have that victory won, you then uh, can take revenge on those disobedient thoughts. So uh, let me address uh, self-pity a little bit. If you have a spirit of self-pity and woe is me attitude, we all are subject to that. There's, in all of us, we can 
in our circumstances in life, we could all say, well, woe is me. I feel uh, self-pity can be a part of our lives. But if you are a born-again Christian, you cannot allow self-pity to enter into your mind or into your, into your thought life or into your heart. Self-pity is demonically driven. If you wallow in self-pity, you are listening to a doctrine of a devil. So you need to stop listening to that self-pity spirit that it says, woe is me, woe is me. We all can do that. I want to be as gentle as I possibly and as harsh as at the same time. Do not let self-pity ruin your life. Because self-pity together, uh, uh, if you let it take root, will also bring depression or vice versa. Depression can bring self-pity. And again, we are all vulnerable to it. You make a choice when it comes, you stop it. I remember when, when uh, our first daughter was born, when Ellie was born, my wife was in the hospital and she literally said she felt a spirit come upon her, a depressing, dark spirit. And she knew, recognized it and immediately took action, told it where to go, and it left. So it's, it's a spirit. And Jesus gave us the tools and the commandments to, up, to, to, to take care of those spirits. In the authority of Jesus Christ and the spirit within us, we have authority over not some, but all spirits. So take authority. The second this thought comes to your mind or this depression or anything comes, you take action. Don't just sit back and hope for somebody to come to pray for you. Take action. Go to the mirror, look into, into the mirror and look in the devil in the eye that's either behind you or somewhere in your eye looking out or whoever he is, wherever he is, if it's, and take action and tell him where to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And he will leave by the authority that is within you. Not by your authority, but the authority that is within you. In John 14, Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. What does that mean? It is, Brother Dave said, the Pastor Dave said the other, a few Sundays ago, it is written. This is written. It was written for our encouragement. Jesus saying, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. Did he just write a word here just to, to, to fill a, a blank page? No, he meant it. There is comfort, but we have to take the first step to, get, uh, to, to plug into that comfort, to get that comfort. You can have a kettle full of water, and you want hot water. You will not get hot water until you do what? Plug it into the power source. When you plug that into the power source, you not only by faith, you know it's going to get hot if there's electricity there, but we know the Spirit of God is there. If we plug into that source, He will bring results. He will bring you comfort. In John 14, verse 26 and 27, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. So you also have a teacher. Did he just write that for the fun of it? No, he meant it. You can teach, every one of us can teach and preach with authority because of the Holy Spirit that he has placed here in his stead. And this Holy Spirit will teach us all things. He will not only do that, he will bring things to our remembrance. If we've forgotten anything, so don't like let Alzheimer's be your excuse or a bad memory. It's the Holy Spirit that can bring things to your remembrance, what you need to remember. Whatever I have said unto you is peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives you, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Do you need any more comfort than this? This is when you're down, you plug into this and say, Jesus, by faith, I trust and believe that this is your word. I can plug in it into this and it will bring results for you. Don't look at anybody else. This is how he is. This is, look at it for yourself. This is what I do. I, when I feel depression or something, it hits me for seconds. I plug into God and I get results immediately. I get them because this is not a lie. It is the truth. It means what it says. It says what it means and it will bring results if you allow faith, the first faith journey of this word to bring uh, or to, to work in your, in your, in your spirit, in your, in, your, in your body, your soul. Uh, isn't it humiliating to be told that we must come to Jesus? Think of the things about which we will not come to Jesus. If you want to know how real you are, test yourself with these words. Come unto me. Do you come when the chips are down? Do you come to him? 
in every dimension in which we are not real, you will argue or evade the issue altogether rather than come. If you start arguing, arguing with yourself and bring up excuses why you're not doing what you're doing, why do I need to come? That's again, Satan, you're siding with doctrines of devils. I call it doctrines of devils because that's what the Bible calls it. If it's, if it's contrary to the word of God, it's a doctrine of devils. So, uh, in every dimension in which you are not real, you will argue or evade the issue altogether rather than come. You will go through sorrow rather than come. You will do, ra you will do anything rather than come the last lap of the race of seemingly unspeakable foolishness and say, Jesus, just as I am, I come. We turn to all kinds of substance abuse, different abuses. They're so much easier. They, sure, they comfort. They, 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 do, they, they uh, take care of the problem for a bit. But the real deal is to come to Jesus, to get him to be that fulfilling role that he claims to be. And he not, just not, doesn't just claim to be, he is. But it's up to you to make it come true for you. As long as you have even the least bit of spiritual dis disrespect, and again, I'll say this again, as long as you have even the least bit of a spiritual disrespect, you will always, it will always reveal itself in the fact that you are expecting God to tell you to do something very big, and yet all he is telling you is come unto me. Come unto me. When you hear these words, you will know that something must happen in you before you can come. The Holy, Spirit will sh uh, the Holy Spirit will show you what you have to do, and you will involve anything, and it will involve anything that will uproot whatever is preventing you from getting through to Jesus. Let's talk some about some of the things that you have to, might have to uproot. Uh, it, it can be self-pity or perhaps unbelief, which I think is, is a, a part of, of self-pity because it's unbelief. If you think about it, self-pity and, and, and any of those things are a lack of belief on your part. You're not trusting what I have just uh, read in Jesus. Right? Come unto me. Come unto me. In, uh, in uh, Matthew 8, 11, uh, verse 28 to 30, is one of my favorite scriptures because it's a direct inv invitation from Jesus Christ himself. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Are you laden? Are you heavy laden? Are you laboring? This is Jesus speaking. And he says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke. There's a yoke. And I'll tell you what that yoke is. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you want that yoke? Do you want that burden? Yoke together with Jesus. He's the one that will carry the 99% of the burden. You just have to be there yoked together with him. And again, going back to the things that keep us from, uh, prevent us from going to Jesus, can be self-pity, can be unbelief, or even a murmuring and griping and complaining attitude. Do we complain a lot? Do we whine a lot about our, our circumstances, our jobs, our conditions, or what we're in? We need to stop. Or it is, is it maybe a lustful heart and mind? All these things can come between us from coming to Jesus and, and uh, connecting to that peace that he gives. We have to make a decision and say when all those things comes and I, I come. And again, I'm not, all of us are susceptible for, to those, those things coming into our lives but we, uh, or, or to uh, come to our minds. We must put a stop to them bearing fruit. And, uh, and you will never get, and this is from uh, Oswald Chambers, I took an excerpt out of Oswald Chambers here. And you will never get any further until you are willing to do that very thing the Holy Spirit will search out and that one un immovable stronghold within you, but he cannot budge it unless you are willing to let him do so. So allow Jesus, allow the love of Christ to penetrate with that very thing that is stopping you from getting into a relationship that you need to be into. How often have you come to God with your requests and gone away thinking, I have re I've, re I've really received what I wanted this time, and yet you go away with nothing, while all the, the time God has stood with his hands outstretched, not only to take you, 
but also for you to take him. Just think of the invincible, unconquerable, and untiring patience of Jesus Christ, who lovingly says, Come unto me. And this concludes my, my part of the message here. Uh, Pastor Dave will now come up and do his part. The Lord bless you. And hopefully, let the Holy Spirit uh, help you in that. He is there and available. Hallelujah. Everybody joyful today. This morning I looked in the mirror. James reminded me when he said he looked in the mirror. So I did the same thing this morning. Actually, I do every morning. I say, Dave, you're a beautiful specimen. All you need is a facelift. <laughs> <laughs> so I get the kick out of myself because I love myself. Why do I love myself? Because Jesus loves me. Hallelujah. And if you love yourself, God loves you. It simply goes in. I'm not talking about high-tuned love. I mean a homely, every day, just one-to-one -one with God. You can't help but thank yourself for making the decision for God. And he gives you the honor of bringing joy, peace. So I recommend, look in the mirror. Dave, you feel good today. Of course, you need a couple of pills first, or maybe a shot of whiskey, or whatever. Whatever cranks you, but you feel good. And God will just look there and say, yeah, got to do something about this. So do you feel good? Yes. Why? Because God is your Savior. You are without con damnation that makes you feel good and that makes you joyful and that makes you happy and that makes you look good regardless what the mirror says. Hallelujah. Anyway, I got a different, a little more serious situation here. It's about the soon coming of the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen closely. We are at a time when Jesus is going to bring in the harvest. We, it's good to know who you are in Christ, but the reason we have to know who we are in Christ, so when the power of God does come, we recognize it, and we tell others, and we have the faith to pray for them, to encourage them. If you have the faith, you will bring many into the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as fire and it sat upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The question is, has the Holy Spirit hit you? Do you speak with other tongues? Do you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit? It's up to you. God gives those gifts to you, and you can utilize them. But you're not going to utilize them by sitting and doing nothing. You have to get involved. To fix a tractor, you've got to take them apart and start working on him. 
This is the same way it works with God. You got to go see people, talk to them, encourage them, pray for them, and see what God will do. I've had a lot of experience with this. This is why I can talk about it. We spend time on Main Street preaching to the natives, and we saw sometimes more action than we could handle, but God was there. Many came to know the Lord. And then it tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 12, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what mean is this? Other mock saying, these men are full of new wine. I want to talk about the new wine a little bit. Have you had the new wine? I want to share something from the natural and from the spiritual. I've had experience with both. I know what it is to drink a bottle or a gallon of wine. And I know how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When you take a bottle of wine, with some people it might do much, but let's say up the end you take a bottle of whiskey. At first you take a little shot, a drink. You start feeling good. That's how it works with the Holy Spirit. You get in, in, in contact with him, you start feeling good. Remember, you can look at that bottle all you want. You're not going to feel a thing. But the moment you take a slug, bingo, something happens. And then you take a little more, and it gets a little stronger and you're starting acting a little more strange. The deeper you get into the bottle, the more it affects you till you hit the ground. I've experienced it. I've been in the power of the Holy Ghost. I've had a little bit where I felt hallelujah. I've had a little more where I started dancing around and singing and laughing. Hallelujah. Sometimes crying reminds you of something. That's why the Lord says, don't be filled with wine wherein is excess, but be you filled with the Holy Spirit. He likens it to it. Then you take a little more of the Holy Spirit, and it doesn't take long. You can land on the floor, praising the Lord with a heart that is wrenched in two. I kid you not. I've experienced it. I know how it feels. So what do you want? Do you want that experience, or are you going to let it go? Here it says they were full with new wine. Maybe some of them fell to the ground. Maybe some of them laughed. Maybe some of them jumped up and down and praised the God, Lord with all their hearts. They were filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where people said, that's not natural. They're filled with new wine. Why did they say new wine? Because that's the only wine they knew. But the apostles now knew the new wine. The, see, the, the Gentiles only know, or the Jews only know, the old wine. But the apostles now experienced the new wine. And they were having a good time. They were starting to preach the gospel, speaking in new tongues. I wonder what they were thinking of themselves. What am I doing? Here I am, talking away a mile a minute, and nobody understands me, even though a lot of people understood them. Guess what? It was a touch and power from the Holy Spirit. 
Have you ever felt that? Have you ever experienced that? If not, you're lacking. And that's simply it. But I got news for you. I got good news for you. God started something with 120 people. He poured his spirit out upon them. And they started acting as if they were full of new wine. Hallelujah. Well, the time is coming for us. We can hurry it up. It's our choice. I've heard it up for myself. I've had the new wine. I've tasted it. I know the effects of it. I know how to operate in it. But it's coming not only to a few people. I'll read on who to who it will come. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days. We are here. It's the last days. Saith the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon what? 120 people? No. How many? All flesh. That's the whole world will be touched by God's Holy Spirit. The word lies not, it is written. All flesh will be touched. They will decide if they love the new wine or not. I know guys who took a swag of whiskey. Yeah, I don't like that. Throw it away, never drink again. That's how people will do with the Holy Spirit. They will get Full. They will either accept it for themselves and pursue it, or they will leave it. It says here, I will put, pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's me and you and everyone else in this world. So be prepared for it. Get ready for it. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You'll start preaching and prophesying of what's going to happen, of what God is going to do. Your young man will see visions. Already we're seeing that. Young men have visions. They have dreams. Old men have visions. They have dreams. Young women are filled with the Holy Ghost. They are prophesying. They're preaching the power of the Holy Ghost. If you read on what's going on in our reign, there's two ladies there, so full of the Holy Ghost, they changed all of our reign into a church state. And it's not going to take very long where there's going to be a change there brought on by the power of the Holy Spirit. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in these days of my spirit, and they will prophesy. Are you ready for that? Or are you, wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. We need to do a little more extra work. We got a little bit of stuff to do yet. Or are you saying, bring it on today? We need the excitement already. Hallelujah. Lord God, bring on your power. Bring on your Holy Spirit. Guess what? If we keep on asking, he will do that. And there's another thing. Whether we ask or not, the time is coming when he will give it to us, whether we like it or not. Because before God closes this down, everybody will have heard from God. And they will know what choice they made for this incredible eternity. 
that is waiting for us. So open your heart to this. Become a blessing to yourself. Start seeking the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen to people who teach on that. And you will find encouragement. The other day, I read a book called Like a Mighty Wind, where the power of God came down. They were so shocked. They didn't know what to do with it at first. But towards the end, they were doing mighty signs, wonders, and miracles. And people came to know the Lord by the thousands. So open your heart to this and become a blessing to yourself and those around you. Hallelujah. Let the Lord open your heart and make you a blessing. Amen. There is a place I read about in God's holy word. It's built upon the mountainside, the new Jerusalem. The walls around that city are in layers of pure jewels. Twelve gates along the walls and every one a single pearl. The glory of that city would blind these human eyes. More glorious still will be the face of Jesus Christ, our King. In garments pure and white as snow, we'll gather round God's throne. And join the saints of yesterday in singing, Home Sweet Home. Inside the city walls, I'm told, are mansions of pure gold. Where death is banished for all time, we'll never more grow old. We'll walk beside the river with the lion and the lamb. All worries will be gone and every pain be left behind. The glory of that city would blind these human eyes. More glorious still will be the face of Jesus Christ the King. In garments pure and white as snow, we'll gather round God's throne. And join the saints of yesterday in singing, Home Sweet Home. In garments pure and white as snow, we'll gather round God's throne and join the saints of yesterday in singing, Home Sweet Home. Home.